Don Lebatard. I know what you like, and I give it to you to make you a junkie so that you're listening and you can't help yourself on the stuff that I got to force feed you. But I know what you like, and I'll give it to you sparingly just to get you addicted. Stugats. You'll stay right there addicted, and every once in a while, I'll give you smack that you don't like, but that you need. <laughs> it's medicine you need. It's the whole formula. We know what you like. It's why you're addicted, even though you hate that part of the show. This is the Dan Lebatar Show with the Stugats on ESPN Radio. This music makes me feel like I have to do something really important. Like, <laughs> I'm either, like, welcoming in uh, uh, some sort of royalty or, uh, you know what, Tim Kirchner. Tim, how are you? you? I'm well, Izzy. I'm well, Sarah. How are you guys? Doing, doing pretty right. well. I don't think you're going to laugh nearly as much because there are no lookalikes today because <laughs> Dan and Stu are not here. But uh, we do have callers for you. We have some baseball questions for you. Um, let's go right to the phone, you know, because I personally don't really have a question for you. Is that okay, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> Quite all right, Izzy. Don't all right. worry. We'll go to Kevin. Kevin, you're on with Kirkton. Hey, Tom. I want to know, do you think Derek Jeter retired early because he knew A-Rod was coming back that next season and he just not? He didn't want to deal with him at all. Hmm. No, no. I think Jeter retired because he played 20 years because he was 40 years old and because he knew that he couldn't be a really good player anymore. And when you reach that level, you don't want to just go out there and be mediocre. So he had this all planned. His entire life was planned from the beginning. And I think he had this in mind, and I don't think it had anything to do with A-Rod. Uh, my fault, Sarah, by the way, because you could have several questions for, for Tim Kirkjian. Do you have anything you wanted to throw out there before I go ahead? Um, I, I was actually going to ask uh, a question. If, if he, what, what his impression so far of how the Cubs have handled the Addison Russell story has been? Well, this is a tricky situation, and um, I think this has got to come from Addison Russell first and foremost, and... The Cubs are going to have to sit and talk to him as they have. They're going to have to sit and talk to him again and figure out what's the best course of action here. But they have to trust their player. They also have to let all the other things take place. So this is a very complicated situation, and they better get it right before they start putting him out there again. Obviously, yeah. Tim, is the is the trickiest part of it that you're base we're basically responding off of a social media comment, and there are no sort of official complaints. Yes, and that's what social media does now. It it brings up stories that normally wouldn't be there, and it puts teams in very difficult situations because social media spreads so quickly. So the Cubs have to get all the answers first, and then make some comments of a real concrete value. Go to Mike. Mike, you're on ESPN Radio with Tim Kirchner. Mike. Nope. Carlos, you got on ESPN Radio with Tim Kirchner. Tom, what's more impressive, a pitcher that could throw 2,000 strikes or a hitter that could hit 600 home runs? I mean, 2,000 two strikeouts yeah. or 600 home runs? Well, 600 home runs is more impressive. There are only nine of those in Major League history. And there's certainly more than nine guys that have struck out 2,000 in a career. Um, strikeouts are at an all-time high these days. A lot more guys are going to be getting to 2,000 before this is over. But 600 homers is pretty darn impressive when we've been playing 125 years and nine guys have done it. Tim, the, the juiced ball conversation has caught some, uh, picked up some steam the last week or so with home runs being on this record pace for this year after just three years ago uh, being – Pretty Up low. 43%. Right, 43%. Uh, your your initial thoughts when you hear juice baseball theories again? Uh, well, I heard this last year, and call me the most naive guy in the world, but I'm not buying it. Um, I think our hitters today are bigger and stronger than they've ever been. And I think our pitchers are so good that when they, when they throw to the location they're trying to throw to, our hitters – have no chance against the best pitchers. But when the pitchers miss in that one great bat path that so many of these pitchers have, they don't just hit a line drive to right field. They hit it 25 rows up. So we have to give the hitters, despite all the strikeouts, a little bit more credit 
that there are tremendously strong guys these days. Now, if I found out the ball was juiced, would I be stunned? No, I wouldn't, but I'm not buying that. I think I think we just have a lot of really good, really strong guys these days who swing and miss all the time, but when they barrel one, it goes a long way. Tim, Jose Canseco, and Mark McGuire were pretty strong. <laughs> they those guys were really strong. Right, but they would be the yeah. outliers then, so they would just they would fit in with the trend now as opposed to being the outliers. Right. So well, perhaps remember there was the big. The strong. There was a big 1987 is the ball juiced season, and uh, some guys that year who never hit home runs hit a whole bunch. So we hear this all the time. I just, again, I've never been a big conspiracy theorist because so much has to happen in order for the, the balls to change. Now I've talked to some pitchers who think the ball is harder. The, you know, the seams are raised, and that makes it, you know, a ball that can travel, you know, farther. But I'm not buying it. I don't think there's anything significant there. Charlie, you're on with Kirkton. Charlie. Hey, good morning, Tim, Sarah, and Izzy. It's Charlie from Vegas. Uh, Tim, you gave me a three, uh, three-team three parlay the past couple of weeks that have disappointingly lost. Can you please help me out with another one? Three winners uh, today. Thank you. No, Charlie, I'm not going to help you out anymore. And, and here's why. This is the beauty of baseball is you can't predict baseball. I used to play basketball with a bookie. He was a great guy. And he told me that anyone who tries to bet on baseball is a complete idiot because it's impossible <laughs> to predict. And I totally agree with that. I can't tell you how many times. I've seen a pitching matchup that you say, well, this obviously favors this guy right here, and we call that a reverse lock, and the opposite happens. The Padres just swept the Cubs the other day. I mean, that hasn't happened, you know, where the team with the worst record in the league sweeps the defending champions since 1973. But in basketball, you got a pretty good idea how this is going to work because Kevin Durant and LeBron James and – and uh, are touching the ball in every possession. That's how you kind of guarantee how things are going to happen. There are no guarantees in baseball. So sorry, Charlie, I'm not going to tell you who's going <laughs> to win tonight because I have no idea, and that's the best part about it. Mike, true or false, Stugatz uh, bets on baseball multiple times during the week. On 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 baseball, mm-hmm. yeah. I thought you were going to ask like something like yeah. crazy, like snooker. No, I'm just saying. In which case, no, the like, answer would have been yes yeah. on snooker. Just confirms yes, that he's an Stugatz idiot. Stugatz is an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Tim, there's a story on 538 with the headline: Ryan Howard's career is dead. The shift killed it, and it talks about how you know it's not his age or his speed or anything else that's kind of uh, removed him from the league, but it, it's the shift. What do you think is the next trend in baseball that might make players uh, sort of? Uh, prematurely uh, removed from the league? Um, Well, the shift is is worth talking about here, Sarah. I'll try to answer your question in a second. Look, I'm I'm sorry. I just can't go with a hitter who says, I can't hit it over there anymore, okay? And this is the only place I can hit it. If they shift that much and you can't beat the shift, then you're going to have to make the adjustment and learn how to hit the ball the opposite way or find a way to play even though they have a shift because it's going to be legal uh, for as long as I can tell, and it should be legal. But it's up to our hitters today, and some of them are really bad at this, to say, all right, I'm going to hit it over there now. But most guys just have that one beautiful swing, which we talked about, and they can't do anything other than that one bat pass. So I'm not going to say Ryan Howard was run out by the shift. Well, he was technically, but that's his fault for not making the adjustment. Anyone else who complains about the shift, sorry, you have to make the adjustment as opposed to the game adjusting to you. Gabriel, Gabriel, you're on with Kirkchen. Go ahead. Hey, Tom, my Diamondbacks, my Diamondbacks, how are they going to do this year? Are they going to fizzle out? I don't think so. I think the Diamondbacks are pretty good, and I think they're going to stay pretty good for the rest of the year. And I think with the trouble the Cardinals are having at the moment, the Mets have had most of the year, the Giants have had all year, I think there's a playoff spot open for the Diamondbacks if they continue to play well. I think they could win a wild card. I think the Dodgers win that division, and Colorado's right with them. But I think there's a place for for Arizona. Plus, they're getting A.J. Pollock back. 
um, in a couple weeks, let's say, and that's really going to give them a boost. Their pitching's pretty good, and they're starting to build uh, a little faith in what they're doing there now. Last one for Kirkjian here, Danny. Danny, you're on with Kirkjian. Go ahead. Hey, Tom. Boxers or briefs? <laughs> Uh, I <laughs> I wear boxers. I at age sixty, at my size, I look totally ridiculous in briefs. So I have worn briefs in like thirty years, and it was bad then. You look totally ridiculous, as if you're going anywhere, just like you know, walking around in your underwear. <laughs> right, but at least I can see myself in them, ah, and nice. I look totally <laughs> ridiculous in them. So I'm not even gonna let myself look at them. Good to know. Good to know. You should. You're never nude or some some version of that. Thanks, yes. Tom. Really appreciate you the mean time. mean I should hang out. Thanks, Tom. Okay, see ya. Don Levitard. Is Stugat shady? I mean, that one's going to come back 100%. Yeah, I have. Thanks, Dan. Stugats. I just don't understand how you object to the idea that, like, it's kind of amazing. Like, I don't understand how you would even object to the idea of anybody in the world calling you shady. Listen, I know I'm shady. I know what I am, okay? I'm more self-aware than you think. I am shady. I'm one of the shadiest people out there. This is the Don Lebatar Show with the Stugats on ESPN Radio. Sorry, we were talking about it with uh, Kirk Jin there for a sec. It's your account, the Chicago Cubs. Uh... Explain, if you can, the Addison Russell situation and how sort of detailed or, tr- or problematic it is for the Cubs. Right. We don't have a lot of detail right now. So uh, Wednesday night during the uh, Cubs game and also the NBA Finals game, Addison Russell's wife posted on Instagram uh, a photo of herself at the beach and then, and then basically a message saying that he cheated on her and it was time for her to move on and essentially implied that they were going to get a divorce or break up. And several comments down, a friend of hers, I think she was getting um, some flack for announcing it socially and publicly, um, and a friend of hers came to her defense and alleged that Addison had engaged in physical abuse, uh, and particularly in front of their two young children. Now, Addison's a young guy, 23, I think, still. Um, so they obviously got married very young, and they have two two young kids, Um and at this point, that's really all we have in terms of reportage. Uh, the Cubs have come out um, and said that they spoke with him. He had been out of the lineup for two days in favor of Javi Baez based on, on his play uh, before this even hit. And Joe Madden alluded to, to potentially um, having had a conversation with him about whatever was going on in his life that maybe was affecting his play, that he hadn't lost confidence in him as a player, but you know wanted to put Javi in for a bit and see if he could uh, come back around. Um, Russell issued a statement yesterday saying any allegation I've abused my wife is false and hurtful for the well-being of my family. I'll have no further comment. Cubs released their own statement essentially saying that he is not was not in uniform last night. They wanted to let him work through the matter. They were not considering it a suspension. They were just electing to have him not come to the ballpark, not be in uniform, and give him some space to kind of figure out what's going on. Um, right now it amounts to a third-party allegation on social media, which back in the old days we might think is nothing, but now is is enough. I mean, we take enough information. I mean, our president essentially makes political statements and official White House statements. Yeah, that's fine, Sarah, but have we, have we ever done this? Have we taken a social media comment and turned it into a, a potential criminal investigation? Like this, um, I would have to. I would have to think about that. But I mean, we've certainly think about um, how how often we're willing to use social media statements as fact in other cases. Whether that's investigating whether Garoppolo is leaving the Patriots because of a post. Whether that's um, LeBron James' mom and some other NBA player being involved in something. Whether it's um, you know, there's there's an infinite number of instances where something has been tweeted or shared. Whether that's Jeremy Tunsil or what's his name, Laramie Tunsil yeah. with the with the bong, wasn't that who that was? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we we now the gas treat mask. the gas mask. We now treat social media as just another way of getting information, and it skips the PR level of a team representative or communications director and goes straight to the source. And we we now have to give it the same weight. Now, of course. There, there cannot be any sort of prosecution of him based solely on this third-party social media allegation. There needs to be actual facts and, and investigation done. Um, what's really tricky, is he, we, which we know about these instances, is in terms of particularly domestic violence and sexual assault, the name of the person accused often is made public and then is always associated with this, whether or not it comes to bear that they, that they are officially 
convicted or even officially charged. Um, and that's an unfortunate side effect. Um, but there's a lot of research that's been done into um, the name of the alleged pers- uh, uh, accused abuser going public allows others to come forward. We've seen it in really public cases like Bill Cosby, and we've seen it in lesser cases. And, and a lot of the research that's been done is pointed to the fact that it's worth the cost in order to best find these these instances and bring them to light. Um, and, and so rarely do we see them actually get charged or convicted or, or prosecuted in any legal manner um, that I think people are searching for ways to better tip the scales in that in that way. Um, I think the Cubs have handled it about as well as possible. And I, I would venture a guess that that's because of the Araldus Chapman situation last year where midway through a season they took on a guy who had a history of this and who had served a suspension for it, and it made them incredibly aware of the language to use, um, Anthony Rizzo, I think, had the very best comment, and that was to say, um, I love Addison, and we have some really good memories together, but I don't know what's going on outside of this clubhouse. And I think it's too rare for players to say, look, I know him as a player and a teammate. I do not know him as a husband or a guy outside of here. Um, so I cannot say that there is unconditional support unless I know the facts. Right. And, and I don't think I think the only way to handle it. Well, regardless of you know situation, teammate, what have you, uh, yeah, you don't know what people are doing inside their own homes, and that's the right thing to say. But here I'm curious about is how we're going to take this. Like, are we going to allow Addison Russell to take the field again and not be judgy because we're talking about, again, a social media post, um, a comment on a social media post being the, the accusation here? And it uh, normally we, you know, we, we get we don't want to see him. Right. It's like, oh, you, right. you've done this. You get off the field. You deserve to be punished for it. We have no idea where this can take us. I would I would say I disagree with Kirkshen, who said that they shouldn't let him on the field until it's resolved. These can be incredibly long processes. And because this is not a situation where police were called, where she went to the police or the hospital or there was any indication of a recent incident or a specific incident, that's it. And this is a really gray area. And I'm sure there's going to be people coming out of the word work saying that I'm saying this because it's a Cubs player. But MLB is also investigating race catcher Derek Norris right now um, because his former fiance claimed abuse. Listen, I think usually where there's smoke, there's fire. I think it's very odd and very rare for false accusations to be made. We know it has happened, but it is very rare. And so I would never say that just because it's a it's an allegation that we don't have um, video or photos of that. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. But but I would say that it is very difficult to take a player off the field for a length of time, an undetermined length of time, for something like this, which is a third-party allegation. Again, I think it's different than, say, if, if, if she had called the police and they'd come to the house, if she had had, you know, some sort of uh, um, very, you know, specific and it was in her own words, allegation of abuse on a specific occasion. I think it's really difficult um, to do this based off of a friend's accusation, which is not to say that I don't think it happened, Mm -hmm. but that it's a lot more difficult to investigate and decide punishment in the now before you've done any real reportage on it. Don Lebatard. Text writes in, does ESPN Brass listen to this show? They can't. Stugatz. How could this possibly continue in a prime spot for this long? (laughs) It's just truly awful radio. This is the Dan Lebatar Show with the Stugats on ESPN Radio. ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the Dan Lebatar Show appear via the Shell Penzo performance line. And now your Sports Center update. Former Buffalo Bills wide receiver James Hardy was found dead floating near the Maumee River in Fort Wayne, Indiana. The cause of death has not been determined. He was 31 years old. The New New England Patriots have signed wide receiver Julian Edelman to a two-year contract extension worth up to $15 million, a source told ESPN's Adam Schefter. ESPN's Mike Reese reports that the extension includes a $5 million signing bonus. And finally, the U.S. Coast Guard picked up a 32-year-old man and his dog from an inflatable duct tape watercraft when it started to take on water Wednesday in Gastineau Channel near Juneau, Alaska. The Coast Guard says in a release that the duct taped boat was homemade. The guard says the man, who was not identified, was not wearing a life jacket. An off-duty Coast Guard member saw the unsafe craft and called it in. The Coast Guard delivered the man, dog, and boat to Douglas Harbor in Juneau. For all the latest headlines and information, tune into Sports Center on ESPN Radio all throughout the day. Hmm. Uh, a couple quick tweets before we get to Kevin Arnovitz. One, watching Is Gutierrez staring off into space, talking to Sarah Spain's disembodied voice is what I imagine talks with God are like. You don't get the show. It's and funny the messages that you get versus the ones that I get. And here's another one. Uh, you guys keep calling him Tom. Way to be professional. 
<laughs> you don't get the show. Oh, I, I'm getting. I wish I was allowed to flirt with you. I think our sexual sensibilities would greatly overlap. Huh. Well, so very different experiences for me. That guy. <laughs> Let's go to this guy, Kevin Arnovitz, on the Shell Benzel performance slide. Kev, how are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing great, thanks. Um, so last year at this time, we saw LeBron James look like the most energized person on the floor, despite having gone to, what, at the time, six straight finals, and we're all like, wow, that dude's amazing. And now we're all talking about how tired he is. Uh, is it a result of the results, or are the, he and the Cavs kind of tired? Um, they're playing against an infinitely more talented team. I mean, I, I think that's the biggest takeaway from this series is it's not a rematch, right? Um, they, they might be wearing the same uniforms. Much of the personnel is the same. And the Warriors with Kevin Durant uh, don't resemble the same team. And in terms of sheer matchup, it, it, it isn't the same. And his exhaustion or the appearance of his exhaustion is directly proportional to just the absolute firepower on the other side of the floor. Going into uh, that third game, I think there were people who imagined that there, that the Warriors might let up a little. There might be a combination of some home cooking for the Cavs, uh, their bench playing a little bit better at home, and also the Warriors sort of just letting up a little because of the dominance of the, of the first two games. After the way that they managed to finish game three, do you think that there's any chance that we get a game four where, where we see that inevitable letdown? No, I think this is a team not unlike its drive for 73 about a year and a half ago or, or that, that early winning streak in the season. Um, no, they want this. And I think there's this sort of, you know, kind of tail to the curve on the chart where, like, the minute it becomes this insurmountable feat, 16 games in a row, they want to do this. I mean, they, they, this is the most historic thing. In some ways, um, I, I think they feel that it would – it would it would answer sort of the disappointment of last season where they were the best regular season team in history and fell up short, kind of that Patriots thing that happened. And that this, in some ways, um, I don't want to say exonerates because they have nothing to apologize for, but I think this is a real thing, and it has never been done, and it might be even more impressive than 73 wins. Talking to Kevin Arnovitz of ESPN.com. Kevin, uh, where do you stand with Kyrie Irving in terms of just his stature in the league, what, what he is? Can he be the leading man on a team? It just feels like he's a great, great sidekick, but probably couldn't be a leading guy. I, mean, I don't want to say he's a novelty act because I think there's so much more skill there. I personally love watching him handle and love watching him finish. I mean, as a just in that regard, I don't think there's anybody, including Curry, that is his dynamic. Hmm. My issue is I don't know what else he's doing on the floor to help you when he's not doing that. He's a decent spot-up shooter. Um, I don't think he has great floor instincts in terms of finding plays and opportunities that might be on the weak side of the floor. Or um, I, I think he's got a feel for the game insofar as that tunnel between him, the defender, and the rim. But I don't think there's a greater holistic approach to the game the way you would see with point guards like, I mean, you could start with, with Chris Paul, obviously Steph Curry, uh, and others. And, and he's a terrible defender. Um, I mean, I, he's a magnet on screens. And so, look, I mean, he was a great point guard on a champ, great championship team last season and performed incredibly well at the biggest moment so um i I bet if you want to look at the larger player that's kind of where i have them but look there are worse things to be than like one of the best handlers and finishers in the league like like that's 40 percent of your grade as a point guard so i don't want to discount it but i just don't think there's the whole game there and and, you know i mean in, in that regard maybe he's like the eighth or ninth best point guard in a league that is laden with point guards so i don't want to be overly insulting but i just think his game lacks the totality of those other ones kevin stugatz likes to talk about how he'll have an asterisk by kevin durant's name if if they do win this title which seems almost inevitable at this point i think a lot of fans would agree based on the path that he took to get to his first championship but given a bit of time and space we tend not to remember the specifics of championship winners whether that's the opponent that they faced or the team that they were on we just remember the the stats and the numbers so do you think kevin durant needs to win elsewhere, or if he puts together a dynastic couple years with the Warriors, that'll serve his legacy well enough. I mean, I kind of think that's an absurd notion. 
I mean, first of all, you don't have to fix everything acid. I just <laughs> said. <laughs> and I, Which with, part? <laughs> with much respect to Stu Goss, I mean, I mean, first of all, look what the guy is doing. I mean. He, in some ways, he took the ultimate challenge, which is, hey, you're going to go to one of the best teams in NBA history, and he's actually going to make them better. I mean, how do you make a team that can't get better better? He, I mean, he's about to put together one of the greatest playoff portfolios and, and finals portfolios ever in, in terms of sheer performance and contribution. But the, the irony of all this is, is it might be at the end of the day that he did carry this team to a championship. Um, I mean, Curry's been incredible, but like... I mean, looking at the body of work, I mean, this, this antiquated notion that somehow everybody wants, you've got to really have to work for it, as if he didn't put in the work, as if he mm-hmm. didn't have what was diagnosed as a season-ending injury, worked harder than anybody, as if he didn't defer to a system that was better than the one he came from, absorb that criticism, both publicly and internally, you know, had Draymond Green in his face when he was pounding the ball against Memphis in January, you know, in front of the entire world you know, deferred when it was necessary, completely committed himself to the defensive end of the floor, and, and again, did what was impossible, which made the best team even better. There was not much room for growth there for the Warriors. That's to the credit. They were already amazing. And so this idea that there's some sort of asterisk affixed to this championship if they close them out, and, and by the way, might do it in 16 games, which in and of itself is historic, so let's put that on the resume as well. I, I just don't get it. I love how Stugatz isn't here, and he still gets somebody worked up with his terrible takes. Because that's as that's as worked up as that's Kevin. How hot been. I'm not easily worked up, as you know. I mean, right. uh, Kev. Uh, so, how do you see this playing out? Like, assuming this series ends in the next game or two, how do you see this playing out in the future in terms of this Warriors team being viewed? Are they going to be viewed as everybody's favorite dynasty? Or are they going to be? I have a hard time believing they're sort of evil empire when you've got the faces of Steph Curry and Kevin Durant on there. Even more than that, I mean, they're fun to watch. You know, for all the stuff about persona with these guys and who's likable and who's not, at the end of the day, I mean, I want to sit and watch two hours and 20 minutes of the Warriors play basketball. It's a great-looking product. It is fun. And I think there will always be a segment of fans who root for the underdog, and this team is so loaded with talent that it's going to be hard for certain fans, I think, to root for them as in a conventional sense because you, know, you want to see the underdog win, and that's going to happen probably in the next few years. There are going to be you, you, you don't want to root for them to be knocked off just for sheer novelty. But I think they're just in, I mean I think the the appeal of the Warriors. Yes, it's about the faces of, of these players we like, but at the end of the day, it's basketball. Like, you're tuning in. Like, you're watching the game. Is this something you want to see? Do you, are you excited for the – I mean, I, I think you get this feeling when the Warriors are playing well that you can't wait for them to get the ball back. I mean, you just can't wait for that missed shot of the other team. So what are they going to do when they rebound this ball in the next 15 seconds? And I think at the end of the day, that is sort of their appeal, is it's just a great product. Kev, you're the best, and don't worry. Uh, Stu Gatz takes just they, they, they go away, like they disappear, and all of a sudden it's <laughs> He'll nothing have a for you new to worry one about tomorrow. <laughs> it's okay, I'm unlisted. So <laughs> thanks again, Don Lebatard. Texter writes in, "Oh wow, Dan, you don't argue and you don't yell. You're so perfect, except you have the face of a 600 pound man." Stu Gatz. I couldn't talk. This is the Don Lebatard show with the Stu Gatz on ESPN Radio. Sarah, why is it the Stanley Cup Final? Versus the NBA Finals. You know, I actually knew that at one point. I actually looked it up to figure it out. I've since forgotten. Perhaps well, hey, our se- wait a second. If far you're away a snob from the Mike Hockey it. dude, perhaps our far away from the Mike Hockey dude remembers. I'm totally stumped, dude. I was just buying it on a burrito. Caught you halfway through that combo, dude. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to be a snob about calling it the Stanley Cup final, you have to know why, Sarah. Well, I did at one point know why, and now it's been so long since I learned that I can't remember. Um, hmm. I don't know if that's how knowledge works. <laughs> well, at some point, there's only so much space in your brain is, and things get pushed out. I need to, like, you know, know things like who Marshmallow Head is so I could keep up with the EDM kids. And I think potentially I pushed out my knowledge of the Stanley Cup final naming in order to accommodate your music taste. How many times do I have to mention him before I get to meet him at EDC Vegas next week, Mike? What do you think? <laughs> are you uh, adding him? Are you adding him? And, other people like, are. Yeah. Well, I'm not. Like, you oh, I got to be verified. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Oh, I don't I know about him. that because, you know. My girl Kate Fagan has tweeted probably three thousand photos of Nike shoes, and she's still trying to get that endorsement. 
So I'm it so, might I'm, take you a little longer. Different than level. Yo, Sarah, do you know how <laughs> Sarah? Do you know how I can get these like free Adidas that everyone at ESPN's like seems to be getting because everyone's doing that move, and I, I'm just assuming that there's something in it for them. Why is which, everyone which tweeting kind out of Adidas, Adidas? Are they getting? I don't know. I'm, let me go to Randy Scott's uh, <laughs> Instagram. I haven't gotten. I got guy. a bunch of Adidas back in the uh, D Rose days, but uh, but not anymore. I'm not. I'm not on the Adidas mailing list. I am fortunately on the Nike mailing list. Sarah, what's your uh, conspiracy theory here on where Dan uh, Levitard and Pablo Torre supposedly are? And okay, by the way, so, you spend way too much time thinking about them. I no, 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 no. Truth. This is actually I really didn't care, but I thought it was interesting that Mike kept saying that he was in the Baltic Sea, and then someone said, "Is he on a cruise?" And you said you didn't think so at first, and I was like, "Well, that's weird. Why would you say the Baltic Sea and not a country surrounding it or a coastline surrounding it?" And by the way, I completely agree with Roy that you usually discuss the coast as in relation to the body of water and not reverse. But either way. Um, I think that maybe he said that because he was being vague about where he was going because he and Pablo Torre were going on vacation together, which would enrage Stu because he's already jealous of their relationship. So when Ron McGill was on and was talking about the animals of the Baltic and said, you know what, I don't really know what's there, probably some whales and stuff, I, out of curiosity, Googled the Baltic Sea to see what area it was in and realized that it was near Denmark and Finland and a bunch of those countries. Oh, I didn't know that was the Baltic Sea. Then... Pablo Torre's Instagram starts popping up with photos of him in Denmark. And I'm like, wait, is this just a random coincidence that two BFFs that are conspiring to one day work together are vacationing in essentially the same area of the world and Dan is being very vague about his location? So you really think that if something were to enrage Stugatz that Dan would not tell him? Well, maybe when he returns, maybe they're waiting for the big payoff of showing off that they had pulled off this vacation together. Uh, you never know exactly the approach that he's going to take to, to stew, Stu's goat. Yeah, just Dan and Pablo and their giant brains just hanging out in the Baltic. Yeah, country. exactly. Like really tick off Stu guys. This is a pretty interesting theory. I think it has legs. Yeah. I didn't think that there was a chance, but she's made a pretty compelling case. And, of course, that whole bro biz nonsense on Pablo's in, uh Twitter, yes. was it? Like, yes, yeah. I tweeted out, and his response was merely a vague sign that is clearly in Denmark that says Brobiz, as if he and Levitard are, you know... Handling Brobiz. Taking care of Brobiz out in the Baltic Sea. But then you pointed out that one of Dan's associates slash relatives works for cruise lines, and now I think he's probably just floating in the middle of the Baltic Sea and is not, in fact, on the coast. But you never know. Is this what it's like when you're trying to figure out if your significant other is cheating on you? <laughs> right, because right. It seems like there's a lot of research well, going on. Well, do you not, know, I've got the find my phone on, thing for Dan's Sarah. phone. Yeah. <laughs> do not oh, yeah, cheat absolutely. on Sarah. Absolutely do not. I, I am a great amateur detective. Uh, Sarah, real quick, we're going to have Steve Levy on uh, at the top of the 12 o'clock hour in about uh, 8 to 10 minutes. And wanted uh, to get your take here, or, or your ex if you can just tell us, because you're more of a hockey fan than I am. Uh, what's going on here with P.K. Subban and, and Sidney Crosby? Because yesterday it appeared that Sidney Crosby was digging P.K. Subban's face into the ice. Right. Uh, you know what? I think we should actually ask Steve Levy about that because I want to get more of a, of a true filled-in background on P.K. Subban because from my perspective, there's often been a, a real sort of um, vagary to why he is disliked, um, and there's certainly a race element to it that people wonder about. Um, but his trade from the Canadiens to the Predators was masked in, uh, in in a lot of suspicion, and he himself has said he's still not sure why he was traded, particularly after he donated like $10 million to open up a wing of a children's hospital and seemed to be an all-around good dude and teammate. Um, so the fact that Mike Milbury is, is saying he, he was asking for it in terms of getting his face smeared into the ice and things like that, uh, this is something I think maybe we need to know a little more backstory to. Yeah, he said, he, uh, Mike Milbury said he had it coming. Uh, I got a take yes. on the whole thing, dudes. All right, you know I love Look Smashville and I got bread cred, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure Sid the Kid just had his glove stuck in the helmet and he was shaking trying to get it off. He's like, if you look at the video, it's like, man, I got my glove stuck trying to help yeah. me out here, dude. No? Nope. What? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, by the way, this random website believes that perhaps it's the Stanley Cup final because it's rooted in the French term finale de la Coupe Stanley. And in that case, it would be singular. That's what I was going to say, but I had the burrito. <laughs> it's America, man. It's finals. 
Okay, Kevin, for the grand prize of one million dollars, what color is the White House? Um, I know this. I know this. I know this. Um, five seconds. Oh, switching to Geico could save you a bunch of money on car insurance. Okay, judges. That's true, Kevin. They'll allow it. Congratulations, you're a winner. Woo! Geico, because saving fifteen percent or more on car insurance is always a great answer.